Proceed. Proceed. Uh, last week, um, a bunch of kids, about 27 of them, with the help of a music fellow and a drama gal, co-wrote a musical comedy. Is that what I saw in the play they're going to do? Yep. It's called Buccaneers on the Bowery. Oh, George is going to be in that, isn't he? Well, he helped write it. Yeah. Uh, and this week, they rehearsed it, designed the costumes and the sets for it. Tomorrow night, they will perform it at 7 o'clock. On Sunday afternoon. Uh, tickets are $10. Uh, they're under 12 is 5, but none of you qualify. Is there going to be a... None of you qualify for the under 12. Is there a matinee the next day? And Sunday matinee at 2. And tickets are being sold here and at the Art Center and at the door. $10 for adults, $5 if you're under 12, which again, none of us qualifies for. We can't I even mentally qualify we're under 12. for that, but they won't. They, <laughs> I get in free on Sunday because I'm going to be video recording the... Are you going to be recording that? And videos will be available? Videos will be available at a, at a whopping $5 a piece. Um, I don't make anything on that. That just covers my cost and my time. Yeah. Uh, the following, a week from tomorrow, uh, which is the 25th of July, Professor, Professor Porkchop and the dishes will be here. They used to be the dirty dishes, but I'm told they cleaned up their act. <laughs> So now they're only the dishes, and I've been hired to record them. So I will, I will, that's a paid gig. Did, did uh, they? Did the professor hire you? No, uh, Harold Stone, who's 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 pay, basically paying for them to come here. They're at Shreveport. They're so, a wonderful uh, band. They and do jazz and blues. And will you sell those videos? I will not be selling those videos. They, what time is it? That will start at 7:30, the 25th. And uh, tickets for that are actually less than normal. Um, I think they're ten dollars general, and when, when it was dirty dishes, they were ten. Like <laughs> uh, no, this is just the, for the band, basically, so they can use it as a. As a I don't think they will. They may, if it comes out real good, they could produce it as a for sale item for their yeah. band. But I think they're going to use it mainly to promote themselves, and uh, that's what they do with it is their business. So that's, well, the, that's the upcoming We know stuff. it'll turn out well, Conrad. We've seen too many of your videos to uh, think otherwise. The show after that is in August, and it's Beyond the Pale. Uh, Beyond the Pale is a Celtic Hello. group. That's uh, not your, Hello. Your pocket is not ringing. Yeah. I just remember, realized I left my phone probably in the car. Oh, yeah, that's well, why it isn't ringing. Well. It's ringing out its head off. Well, it's okay. Like it. Anyway, Beyond the Pale will be here August fifteenth. And they're a wonderful group. Bad shape. They're out of uh, Mesquite, <laughs> and they do Celtic over oh, here, and they're good, really, really good. Well worth coming to see. And that's it for the summer. Um, the rest of the year is posted. Adler and Hearn in September. Okay, well, um, I'll let you go. Uh, they'll be quiet. Draha, Draha Trava, which is, is a bluegrass band from the Czech Republic. What's the name of it? Draha Trava. Okay. And I'd spell it to you because it's hard to pronounce. Um, they've they've been around a while. I remember when they've they, been here many times. They love it here in Winsboro. But and, they and they're from the Czech Republic. And yeah. they play bluegrass music. From the Czech Republic? Yep. Yeah. Apparently they do quite too. <laughs> including, <laughs> including occasional Beatles on, with, with bluegrass. Yeah. They, were, they were famous and you know, to the extent Czech bluegrass groups become famous. That's right. That's way right. before I ever moved back to Texas. You know, I, I used to read about them in Bluegrass Unlimited. Oh, really? I'd never heard of them until I came into them. So here and then the end of October, Bing Futch will be here. Bing Futch is a dulcimer player. He's a marvelous dulcimer player. Last year when he was How here... How are you spelling I, his name? F-U-T-C-H. He pronounces it Futch. Futch. Uh, 
Last year when he came in, I said, oh, who wants to hear dulcimer? Spend two hours listening to dulcimer music. That'd be the most boring thing in the world. Well, it was, I was told it was a marvelous concert. He plays other stuff, too. And since then, I started learning to play the dulcimer. So now I think the dulcimer is the greatest instrument in the world. <laughs> How your perspective changes in a year. So anyway, uh, that's that. And then... Uh, you want to come down to open mic tonight? Melanie is going to sneak in at some point. She was a rock person of the... Brand new key. Yeah. And uh, I never really liked her music, but... The guy doing the thing loves her music, so she's coming. <laughs> Jim Phyllis loves her music. He wouldn't get... Uh, I tried to get Jim to book uh, Jake Shimabukaro, the world's greatest ukulele player. Yeah, he's, he said I was probably the only one that would come to him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, uh, Shannon went to hear him at uh, the Kessler in Dallas, and it was packed. You know? I'm sure it was. And then in January, uh, the two guys from the American Guitar Master Series will be back again. We had them last year. They came on a Monday night. Uh, they were absolutely stunned that they had an audience on a Monday night. Uh, but we uh, we had a about half to three quarters of the house full for them, and they're marvelous, absolutely terrific. So we're looking for a full house this time. And they, they said, we want to come back. But several times during the performance, they said, I can't believe people are here on a Monday night. <laughs> so, anyway, so that's all that's, that's coming up. And uh, actually, Vance Gilbert is coming back. Uh, Vance has played Winsboro four or five times, and we love having Vance here. And so we've got a good year coming up at the Art Center at the Bowery Stage. So that's it for my announcements. What was the word from the doctor? Ain't going to be here. Really? Oh, Let's well, we might as well get gear. to it then. Y'all brought your poetry? No. We brought our ears. Okay. Well. Doc said he was going to read cowboy poetry. And I told him he's in big trouble. Well, what happened? I don't know, he had something about washed up base, he had to get to somebody and had some other stuff to do, so. Okay. Okay. Well, Jim, looks like, uh, unless, okay. Con unless uh, Conrad wants to start. I'm going to start. Uh, I've got a, I've read this. Change made. Ready now. <laughs> you ready? You sure? Yeah. <laughs> I've read from this guy a couple months, two, four months, four or five months ago. His name is David Russell. He was the poet laureate of the state of Texas. Um, back in the 40s. Uh, this book was published in 1945, and um, I read a few things out of it uh, back then, and I'm going to read a few more. Uh, now. Again, remember this was published in 45, so, uh, although I don't think there's much about the war in here. This is called Farm Wife. Wife? Farm Wife. Her cheeks are gaunt with many winters sorrow. Her sturdy form, long broken by the plow, bears yet a touch of grace that women borrow from earth's etern eternal dower. Here the bough is faithful to its trust, her scattered band has left a legacy of pot and pail that she shall never shake. This withered hand, though lean and weather-beaten, shall not fail. At dusk she halts amid her common chores and sets her eye upon the western slope. Some unnamed need has brought her out of doors, some ancient beauty, long forgotten hope that once was bright, she scans the sky unshaken and then returns to broil the even ba evening bacon. That's the end of that. That's the end of that? That's Farm end. wife. Farm wife. This is called Old Martin. Jeb Martin had a stiff bent knee that served him well, but made him seem a bit benumbed and shadowy, as though he hobbled through a dream. 
I'm sure he never knew at all we children saw him as a troll. To us he had a fabled look, a creature moving out of time, came from a goblin fairy book to mock the innocence of rhyme. No doubt he would have known surprise could he have seen within our eyes. And yet inevitably he chose twilight as his hour for roving. Among the shades he seemed to be only a darker shadow moving. Just where he went we did not know. We only saw him come and go. We never were quite close enough to learn the features of his face. He always seemed to be far off as though his limping needed space. If anyone had seen him well, close up by day, he did not tell. How many days he came and went, no one remembered. Still he came at twilight like a shadow bent, not so much man as shadow name. We watched and somehow thought it right that he limped only close to night. He loved the darkened lanes where trees with night and silence were entwined. His nearness to them seemed to please and the unknown longings of his mind. I wonder if by chance he could have once inhabited a wood. This one's called Tick Tock. I do not think, said Jason, that I shall ever find a clock so anapestic that it can tick my mind. For time is so ecstatic in its monotony, it cannot touch one contour of this erratic me. So yesterday he boasted, and those who heard agreed, no measure metronomic could clock so rare a breed. But now that he lives under the cold sod on the hill, time ticks in perfect measure the oneness of his will. This is called the needle in the haystack. While searching for a needle hidden in the hay, I came across a lot of things lost another day. I didn't find the needle, but in the fuss and stir, I found a lot of things that I had wondered where they were. Well, I might as well read another one since we've got so many poets here. This is called The Crows. I do not blame the crows that they must caw and carp. Theirs is, at day's dark close, a stern and somber harp, on whose discordant strings the bitterness of life must speak these bitter things in corporate in strife. Do not wish them ill. Theirs is a primal part of that coherent will that struggles in every heart. As well as dove or wren, they shadow and proclaim something unnamed in men that seeks an outer name. Though their discordant cry is raucous and profane, better the whole should die, better the heart be slain, than that they be denied proportionate debate or that love seal their pride beneath a stone of hate. Theirs is a right as well, inalienable and clear, to speak what they would tell. Ours is the right to hear. Until the story comes, perfect in all its parts, even though the cawing numbs pride that would take our hearts.
do one more. This is called Texas Nights. It's not quite night here. Nights come really late here. Texas Nights are wide and high with jewels floating in the sky. The moon is like a queen of lights who dreams of love through Texas nights. Texas days are full of sun. The sands are golden as they run. There is a magic all may praise who walk the sun of Texas days. But Texas nights, when star by star, sings to the strum of love's guitar. The fairest of all mortal sights are vibrant singing. Texas nights. That's what I got for tonight. So he was the poet laureate of Texas in what? Texas in the forties, I would assume. So okay, so I don't have the exact. I don't have the exact, uh, the exact date. I don't know if there's a date on this piece of paper here. Um, anyway, this is a signed first edition by David Russell with a Christmas greetings note inside which you may purchase from my shop. Destroying an extraordinarily reasonable price. So, so Jim, Jim. I tell you not to be nervous, but I know you're going to be nervous anyway. <laughs> Well, I'd forgotten all about this until I got back from the sale barn today and my wife asked me if I was going. <laughs> so I said, well, let me put something so together. She saw the email. Man. So uh, this is two little short ones that okay. I have. The first one is called Life is Good. It's the time of day to put your feet up after a hard and taxing day. Recline in that lawn chair and pass the time away. It's as simple as the sunset that sets behind the woods. If you are asking me how I'm doing, well, you know, my life is good. That's it. This one, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> you want to live life to its fullest. You don't want to live off old regrets. You only have one shot at life. You want to settle all your debts. You want to meet your day with vigor. You want to live to the... <laughs> you want to give to surprise. You want to live your life to its fullest before the heart inside you dies. That's all I got. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Do it's better. I'll do it's better. better than what I brought. I'll do better <laughs> next month. Hey, you can read anything. I, I got faith in I you. I just didn't bring it. Well, uh, I, I got all kinds of poets here. I want to read a Tennyson or a Poe or. That's okay. This is the way you focus and make the picture. So you halfway down, gotta make halfway up. down, uh, gotta make focus, up. halfway down. Uh, That's the charge focuses here. Focuses it all the way down, makes the picture. What you see. How do you zoom in? Focus here. That okay. Here. You trust me with your camera? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to know what happened to a lady that gave me her camera one time at a jam. We're never satisfied. Yeah. No. There's another mountain to climb. Uh, I'm going to read, I'd been reading my daughter's work, my, my late daughter's work for several months. Last month I read one of my own again, kind of changed things up, and uh, in this I'm going to go back this time and read another one of my late daughter's poems. Uh, she died in uh, August of 2012 in California, living out there by herself, you know, died alone. Oh. Um, and uh, her, you know, it was one of those things where her daughter, then living in New, New Zealand, and my son, then living in Dallas, had to go to California, you know, to do everything that had to be done, you know, and it turned out my son went because he figured Sonny would need some help. And it turned out she was a basket case, according to my son. And you know, uh, he really—it was—it was very wise and nice of him to go. But the interesting thing is that the name of this poem—I I haven't read this one before to this group—is called Ten Things to Do Before You Die." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and it's uh, it's not an epic poem and I, I have read some of her epic poetry here where, it, where I had to break it down and do it in uh, two or three uh, two or three installments and uh, but this one is kind of what I it's not a short like uh, D David Russell's David Russell write poems about the judging from tonight about like in my favorite poet is Emily Dickinson and one of the things that she one of her characteristics is is economy of words and verses she does she, she doesn't write epic poetry. I'm not saying she hasn't, but I'm not familiar with any of it. <coughs> and they're all <coughs> very short poems, like <coughs> David Russell. <coughs> so, uh, this is what, I, for, for my daughter, this would be a, uh, a medium poem. You know, by no means epic, but not one of the short ones. Like here, One that I have read here before is called Breakfast. You know, and it's, uh, I don't know. 12 or 15 lines. Okay, so I'm going to read tonight uh, for my daughter's uh, poem, uh, 10 Things to Do Before You Die. My feet are cold, so cold, you said, and I put my hands between the sheets to feel, and you were like ice, hard and somehow th uh, thick, so as if your body were there more dense than mine, and far too solid beneath the blankets. I could not help remembering your face that time in Mexico when we lay naked on the beach at midnight and you looked up at me with such longing, your face white in the moonlight and needy, begging. You pulled me closer, your skin thick with sweat and I closed my eyes as your lips touched mine ever so softly. Did you keep that promise you made in spring, that time the dog danced away from us in the park? chasing a kite and you laughed and pulled me back and said let him have his fun then you put your hands into my pocket and whispered that you would never forget this day you would never forget this moment caught in the sunlight you were so beautiful that it hurt to look at you you were wrapped inside my heart you were safe we were safe and the trees swayed so prettily in the breeze do you forgive me for the time I hit you, not meaning it? Never ever meaning to hurt you, but dear God, how I wounded you, and oh, that look in your eyes, that look that almost broke my heart to bits, but I refused to let it, refused to linger on your face, and the tears in your brown eyes, how could I have done those things to you, my love? Did you, do you, will you forgive me? I dream sometimes of the place we met, so inauspicious, so inelegant, the bright music, the dancing bodies, exchanging pills and telephone numbers between the beats. I had been there before and done it all, but when you appeared beside me, a renaissance angel, your hair in perfect curls, smelling like flowers, something awoke inside me, something unfurled, and I became the man I always wanted to be for you, for you, my love. The house we bought, that dreadful old thing, you swore it would be beautiful with just a little work, rotten floors, decayed plumbing. You stood in the filthy rooms with the light in your eyes and laughed when I made a face at the mice and the spiders. Your face was glowing, and you whirled me around and said, please, please buy it. So, of course, I bought it, and somehow the dream was never realized, but we had fun, didn't we? Spending weekends with blueprints, paint chips, fabulous, hopeful wishes that brought us to bed tired to wrap ourselves around each other, drift away happy. But you always were a dreamer. That time we found those baby birds. Fallen from on high and you were so sure they could be saved that we stayed up with them for five nights with heaters and bottles and Mozart on the stereo because you just knew that it would help. Crooning mammal lullabies to tiny avians who would never try their wings. 
And when the last one died, you cried, and I held you tight against my chest, not knowing what to say to soothe you, and kissing your auburn curls. I remember a summer day when you came to my office and let yourself in, smiling, secretive, sweet, luring me from the desk with chocolate kisses. And whatever was I doing that was so important, I cannot recall. We had hot dogs in the park, and you said, with extra relish, and laughed as if it were a terrific joke. And we both laughed, and I don't know why. We had ice cream cones after licking the cream and giggling at each other like children over those melting white mountains. I was unfaithful only once, but you found out and would not speak to me. How can I forget those days and nights of anguished silence? I was such a fool. You marched through our life like a soldier, all grim challenge and salute, pulling out suitcases, but not quite unpacking, not quite ever looking in my eyes until I could not stand it any longer begged you to forgive me. I swore never again. I told you never again. And do you know, I didn't. I never did again. And when we finally wept together, drinking that awful gin, hiccuping apologies, you pulled me to our bed and drunk or not, made frantic love to me for hours licking the sweat from my skin like a cat after you wrote me out once, twice, and then, damned if you didn't do it again somehow. Neighbors pounding on the wall. I screamed your name again, gasping for air and loving you more than ever. And when they told me you were sick, I panicked. I went out to drink and not home to you. It could not be true. I could not let it be true. It was not true. And so I was angry finally, but you were so patient, so calm. How could you be so calm when the sky was falling? When the days are numbered like pages of a book and you feel the little bit that's left and try to slow down somehow, to stop the flow of words, the flow of things, rushing to the last page, a torrent of minutes and moments, each one glistening, glowing, with your image at the center. No, it cannot be true, but it is true, and your glow dims little by little, and the sound of the oxygen tank takes the place of your soft breathing by my side at night. My waking dreams are filled with demons, but what of yours, my love? What do you dream of? as your days slip into something half forgotten, a summer day long ago when the ice cream fell on the pavement and you laughed, and the kite flew high and far, and the dog barking after it, and the sun shining on the greenest grass in Christendom. What are you thinking, love, as I hold you to my breast, as if my hammering heartbeat can do double duty somehow, pull you from the drowning sea, our bed so cold, you say again, and I rub your solid flesh to warm it, but your eyes are distant as you look up at me from beneath the waves, and somehow you smile at me, that smile, I'd know that smile in the dark, a touch by the feel of my heart. And it hurts, that smile. And I'm crying again, though I said I would not. And I kiss your eyes, your face, your lips, as you murmur, don't worry, thinking of me, even as the dark water pulls you down, and you are so cold, I love, but not as cold as me. The end.
Uh, Edward Hirsch, How to Read a Poem, One Paragraph. I am reminded by Calvino's description of the literal limits of art that all the incitement and grace of literature has to take place in the lineup of written characters on the page. There is then creative reading as well as creative writing. Emerson says in The American Scholar, in a statement that could be a credo for the reader of poems, poetry alerts us to what is deepest in ourselves. It arouses a spiritual desire, which it also gratifies. It attains what it avows, but it can only do so with the reader's imaginative collaboration and even complicity. The writer creates through words a felt word, which only the reader can vivify and internalize. Writing is embodiment. Reading is contact. In the presence and the preface to Obra Poetica, George Lewis Borges writes, the taste of the apple, states Berkeley, lies in the contact of the fruit with the palate, not in the fruit itself. In a similar way, I would say, Poetry lies in the meeting of the poem and the reader, not in the lines of symbols printed on the pages of a book. What is essential is the aesthetic act, the drill, the almost physical emotion that comes with each reading. The end. Kind of a long paragraph. That was great. Yes, thank you. By the way, great.